All right, y'all. I'm back again with some more Tough Enough uh, coverage. Uh, as you know, I covered the uh, USA Network being upset with the Tough Enough ratings. Well, here we're going to do something a, a little special. This is Tough Enough, Where Are They Now? As in, who the fuck cares? Anyway, for those of you who visited WWE's YouTube uh, channel recently, you will have no doubt seen the plethora of minute-long fan-submitted videos on there with the Tough Enough returning uh, this year, as you know, basically being the game show joke that it is. Even though WWE pitched the show as a chance to live out your dream and become a future sports entertainment star, the odds of that happening should you win the competition are surprisingly slim. Even if you get in, the longest you last is either six years, if that long. You are more, you are more likely to become a name in the business if you don't win the competition something that Ryback, The Miz, and even The Boogeyman can attest to. Now, for those of you who know The Miz, originally, he started off on an MTV reality show, non-wrestling. That's how he got in. He just came along in wrestling. He came along in wrestling uh, later. No former Tough Enough winner has main evented WrestleMania, but The Miz has, unfortunately. A couple have went on to have good careers in the business, but they haven't developed into headline talent. Some people have it in them, and some don't. That's just the way it is. But what happened to those former Tough Enough winners? The likes of Linda Miles, a.k.a. Hot Sexy Mocha, and Matt Capulet and Matt Capa, Capitaletti, uh, excuse me, Matt Capitelli, who were promised the world but ended up leaving the company. Basically, promised the world, ended up with nothing. After troubled and or unspectacular runs there, some of their post-wrestling vocations may surprise you. Matt Capitelli, as you remember, got the shit kicked out of him by Bob Holly. Of course, his way of making people understand the business or respect the business. Yeah, right. As far as winners go, you couldn't pick one better than Maven, Maven Huffman. Charismatic, athletic, and a quick learner. Good looking too. Nice shaved head and everything. Maven had a lot of attributes that make a WWE superstar. Maven, Maven was thrown in at the deep end, feuding with The Undertaker, who famously eliminated from the 2002 Royal Rumble. Maven floundered in the mid-card for the next couple of years before he began feuding with members of the Evolution in late 2004. This feud included a Raw main event match against Triple H, which succeeded in making Maven look like a future star. It, would, it was frequently rumored that Maven would be joining the stable, but it never happened. I guess Triple H didn't think he, he had the look or what, what was good enough. Instead, Maven formed an entertaining tag team with fitness guru Simon Dean. I miss Simon Dean. He was actually up talented and pretty good. When Dean was transferred to SmackDown in spring 2005, WWE saw no use for Maven and released him. Wow, what a surprise. The guy went through 13 weeks of hard training, basically bullshit, to get released after what? I guess uh, two or three, maybe five years at the most. Following his release, he worked for some indie promotions, including the TNA-affiliated UWF, and also appeared on season six of VH1's The Surreal Life, which I saw in 2005. He retired from wrestling in 2007. A tumultuous few years followed, Maven had developed a bad drug habit, which landed him in trouble with the law. And you can, and if you read up on that, you can find his mugshot posted online. That's how I found it. Also, as note, uh, Somebody recognized him in New York. He was, he was working as a bouncer, but when somebody, but when that person recognized him and tried to talk to him, he had an attitude. I guess I guess he's a little, he's a little bitter. Uh, sorry, folks. Um, gathering my thoughts. Maybe had developed a bad drug habit, which landed him in trouble with the law in 2012, when he was found doctor shopping, going from doctor to doctor in order to get refills. He subsequently entered WWE-sponsored rehab and managed to clean himself up. Today, Huffman is re reconnecting with fans on social media and regularly posts on Twitter and Instagram. He provides commentary and does interviews from extreme cage fighting, as well as recently working as a bouncer in New York. Y you can find him at, H at a website on Instagram. He still looks exactly the same and is in really good shape. Well, Maven... Uh, Good luck. And also, recently, he's getting back into, he, he, he's uh, planning on getting back into wrestling. So, we want to we want to wish Maven uh, uh, the best. 
aside from Maven's theme song and, introduce, and introducing Nidia to Jamie Noble, WWE's 13-week Create a Superstar series has contributed nothing to professional wrestling. That is true. Year after year, competition after competition, these goofs are shown taking back bumps and listening to Triple H lectures on eating, sleeping, and breathing this business. What Triple H doesn't tell them is you have to eat, sleep, breathe, and kiss ass in this business. That's what he did. He's the sole heir to the front. He's the sole heir to the throne of whack ass wrestling entertainment, basically due to marrying his daughter. But breast cancer only happens in October, and the Hulkster needs something to do. So, whatever. The the the, uh, the Miz is the only contestant to win the WWE Championship, and he was a runner up. Boy, and they say, and for what? Who has achieved success? We'll get to that in a minute. My favorite of the T winners the forgot, is the forgotten Linda Miles, tall dark, tall, dark, and sassy. Miles played basketball for Rutgers before entering the squared circle. Her natural athleticism and size made her an easy selection as the next WWE diva. However, she needed a gimmick, enter dominatrix, and a manager for a tag team known as the Basham Brothers, one of the most underrated duos ever. With two white dudes and one black woman towering over them, there was no other option than s and Fifty Shades of Shaniqua, baby. The dominatrix led her whipped lackeys to the tag team titles, but was fired within two years of gaining a contract from Tough Enough. But she was ten years ahead of her time, and, and clearly E.L. James was inspired. Also note, now, the reason why she was released, when they thought she was, uh, when they thought she was too green in the ring, Vince McMahon and the company sent her back to Ohio Valley Wrestling, which was run by Jim Cornette at the time. Her and Jim Cornette basically clashed because uh, Jim Cornette claimed she had an attitude, and she did develop an attitude and a, and, and a diva prima donna attitude, you know, a personality backstage. Basically, I guess, you know, trying to become a star, it comes to the territory, you, you go a big head. Because of those two clashes, and of course, I'm sure Jim Cornette had pull, which is why she, uh, she was a release. But moving on, Daniel Pewter, who, who you, if you remember from uh, Tough Enough uh, Season 5, became a hero of sorts in certain circles when, 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 he almost, when he almost made Kurt Angle tap out in an unplanned spur-of-the-moment shoot fight. Angle had easily beat Chris, Nowin uh, 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 Chris Nowinski and broke one of his ribs in the process. On November 4th, 2004, SmackDown challenged, and challenged any of the other contestants to step up. Up stepped Pewter, who had previously trained in MMA. Pewter caught Angle off guard with a very painful Kimura lock. What was happening backstage, Jerry Briscoe instructed referee Jim Corderas via his earpiece to count Pewter's soldiers to the mat and end the contest. Angle was furious and had some very stern words for the rookie afterwards. Pewter won the million dollar tough enough beating co-finalist The Miz, whom he had narrowly defeated in an amateur boxing match at Armageddon in 2004. Pewter was not well liked by the SmackDown locker room after the Angle incident, and he did not endear himself with his cocky attitude either. Pewter, Pewter's most notable WWE appearance was in the 2005 Royal Rumble, where he was brutally chopped by Hardcore Holly, Eddie Guerrero, and Chris Benoit before being eliminated. Holly hated Pewter after he had told his friends that he had been beat that he had beaten Holly for for real in a house show. After that, he was sent to Ohio Valley Wrestling to learn how to work, but the WWE decided to release him in September as a cost-cutting a, a move. What was, what was Peter been up to since? He had some shoot fights, worked briefly for Ring of Honor in 2007 and 08, and gave a lot of interviews where he talked smack about Kurt Angle. Now retired from MMA, he works for the he works for My Life Power, an organization that mentors children and teenagers who have been who, have, who are victims of bullying. He plans to wrestle again in 2015. Of course, we haven't seen that yet. Moving on. Poor Matt Capitelli. The co-winner of Tough Enough 3 did not have a storybook career in WWE due to injuries and frequent bouts of illness. First, first Matt broke his fibula in a tag team match in 2005. Then he suffered a couple of serious concussions. It was while being tested for concussion, however, that WWE doctors discovered that he had a malignant brain tumor. He lived with the tumor for a year before getting surgery to remove it. It took 30 radiation treatments and a long recovery process to rid, to rid him of it. All of this 
after guest trainer Bob Holly controversially roughed him up on a worldwide television. Matt did eventually work in in a program with Holly in 2004 before his health woes uh, began, but it remains a sore subject among fans who felt that Holly went a little too far with the newbie. That's Bob Holly, folks. An egotistical, muscled up uh, personally, I think, probably one of the biggest muscled up rednecks in the industry. But whatever. Capitelli's WB contract expired in 2009. It was not renewed. Since then, Capitelli has been working in Ohio Valley Wrestling, becoming a trainer in the Beginners program. More recently, however, the deeply religious 35 year old has been working as a motivational speaker and manages a couple of, of gyms. He's doing very well t for himself. And Mr. Capitelli, I salute you. You don't need WWE, but you know, WWE, I think started this whole process to lure young fans with the lure of money and fame. And they're finding out the hard way, there is no money and fame, only heartache, heartbroken, emotionally and physically. Unless you kiss Triple H's ass, Unless you kiss Stephanie and Vince's ass, you're not going to make it. That's why I'm surprised the Miz and Ryback uh, uh, made it so far. Of course, I believe they're ass kissers. Now we move on to Linda Miles' white counterpart, Jackie Gata. Remember her? May not have been the most talented person to try for Tough Enough Season 2, but her decision to gut it out and continue to train when she suffered a serious knee injury con convinced WWE officials that she had what it took to be a WWE diva. And I think, I, I think uh, uh, WWE officials are the real judges of Tough Enough. They decide who wins. Not the judges, the trainers, who you see on camera. What you see on camera is basically bullshit. It's the TV executive producers and officials who approach Vince McMahon and say, when Vince or somebody says, hey, I want her in WWE, let's script the show where she wins. And just tell the trainers to eliminate everybody else. I think that's how it goes. Those same officials were probably asking themselves what the, what the hell were, were we thinking after Gata's horrible performance in the infamous tag match in which she teamed with Christopher Nowinski to take on Trish Stratus and Bradshaw on July 8th, 2002 Raw. And folks, you can see that match on YouTube anytime. It is hilarious because Trish was pissed. She botched so much, I've never seen uh, 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 so, many botch, uh, 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 so many botches in my life. Jackie botched several moves and generally looked like she had no idea what she was doing, which to be fair to her, she didn't She didn't since she hadn't received the proper enough training to be in a match like that. She bounced back with her, with her role as Miss Jackie, valet to the infeminate Rico after a long stint in Ohio Valley Wrestling. That figures. Life imitated art when Jackie and Rico's um, partner, Charlie Haas, fell in love. They married in 2005, but WWE fired them both after just returning from their honeymoon. Since then, Jackie has done some modeling work, had a brief run in TNA, gave birth to four kids, two girls and two boys, opened a, opened a nutritional fitness store with her husband and done the rounds on the convention circuit. Well, well, well. Good for you, uh, Miss Jackie Gator. But if they knew they, had, they didn't give her the proper training, why the fuck would they put her in the match? I guess because they like to look so much, they wanted to get her on TV ASAP and alongside Trish Stratus. That was a bad idea. <laughs> because, like I said, she's botched more than Cena botches. Uh, she, she's, uh, she botched more than Cena uh, 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 botches in the ring and botches his promos. Of course, Cena's promos uh, stink anyway. But with that being said, moving on. Now, once again, Hot Sexy Mocha. Linda Miles was a co-winner of Tough Enough Season 2, and it's not easy to see why WWE signed her up. It's easy to see why WWE signed her up. Excuse me. She was big, athletic, and appeared to be a natural in the ring. Miles debuted, Miles debuted on WWE TV as Shaniqua, the dominatrix man, manager of, of the Bashams, as you know. Later in the year, she began dominating the rest of SmackDown's divas and brutally beating them down. Miles took a month off in late 2003 after suffering a clothesline from hell from Bradshaw, returning with... with returning with surgically enhanced breasts, which she claimed had been swollen by Bradshaw's lariat in a ludicrous angle. Wow, how original is that? That was a dumb thing, that was, that was a dumb thing to have her say. It was around this time that Miles was getting a really bad reputation backstage for her prima donna behavior. 
how did WWE punish her? By, by regularly booking her to take a Rikishi sting face on house shows, of course. This basically, my, this basically Miles role for her last few months in the company. Her last appearance was at the 2004 No Way Out pay-per-view. She was released in late 2004 after no showing several Ohio Valley training sessions and house shows. As I noted before, the reason she didn't show up for her training sessions because of her uh, clashing with, with Jim Cornette. I'm, I'm pretty sure Jim Cornette knew she sucks because you know Jim Cornette, he's a straight shooter. Anyway, what has the imposing Shaniqua been up to since? First, she tried to get a job as a sportscaster and then became a substitute became a substitute teacher in Cincinnati. It was reported in the Wrestling Observer in March 2014 that Miles was seen on TV at a Division I's women's college basketball game. Miles had, had previously tried out for the, for the WNBA but didn't make the cut. She now referees women's basketball games, as shown in the picture on the article. You, you can see a picture of that on, on a website I found. Uh, I guess Hot Sexy Mocha went to Hot Sexy Stripes. Anyway, moving on. Big Andy Levine, remember him from 2011, uh, Tough Enough. Trained under Stone Cold, uh, Steve Austin. Big Andy has, ha has to go down as the one of the biggest WWE disappointments in recent memory. Levine actually signed a developmental uh, contract with the WWE in 2010, but was released from it in January 2011 in order, in order to try out and participate to Tough Enough. Levine was miraculously announced the winner of the competition. Despite being one of the big markers early on, pretty much nobody had Andy pegged as the eventual as the eventual winner, but sure enough, he defied the odds and won. Levine was given a Vince McMahon slap and a Stone Cold Stunner on the June 6, 2011 as a welcoming gift to the company. Backstage, officials were reportedly furious that Andy didn't sell the two moves for long enough. Oops, red flag right there. When you don't sell moves, you're basically out. It didn't really matter anyway since he was going back to train in FCW. Regardless, while training, he failed a wellness policy. Oh my God, he failed a drug test. What the fuck was he taking in the first place? I'd sure like to know that. So what's he been doing in the past three, in the past three years, and where is he now? Levine continued to wrestle, devoting most of his time to the World Wrestling Council in Puerto Rico. Some recent YouTube videos he posted showed him lifting some seriously heavy weight, and he looks to be in great shape. And is a WWE return in the cards? Probably not. Probably one of the more, the more truer. You will never see Andy Levine again. And his whole gimmick was he was going to be known as Silent Rage. Well, whatever drugs he failed, I guess you could call him Silent Roid Rage. I don't know. But moving on again, WWE stumbled upon something with Nydia. Yeah, you remember Nydia, don't you? Jamie Noble's trailer park trash uh, 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 sidekick. She wasn't the best wrestler in the world, far from it, but she undoubtedly had a lot of charisma and a certain presence to her. Nydia was the female winner of the first season of Tough Enough alongside co-winner Maven Huffman. Setting the precedent for all those that would come after her. After the requisite spell in Ohio Valley Wrestling, Nitty was given a role in WWE TV as Jamie Noble's trailer trash girlfriend. Their act was a, was a riot, and Nidia looked comfortable in the ring and in backstage skits and promos. She engaged in, she engaged in a memorable feud with Tori Wilson in 2003, which led to the two divas, Noble and Billy Gunn, having a foursome on an episode of SmackDown. You gotta be kidding me. Nidia was given another uh, another memorable storyline later that year when she was blinded by Tajiri's Black Mist attack. This led to a feud between Nidia and her exploitive boyfriend, which culminated in a dreadful blindfold match at No Way Out 2004. She was drafted to the Raw brand a couple of months later, but didn't do a whole lot before being released in on November 3rd during a talent uh, talent purge. She briefly flirted with the Indies, but had a kid and dated X-Pac before deciding to pursue a culinary career and is now a full-time chef in, the ho in her hometown of Houston, Texas. Nydia hasn't uh, severed all ties with the business as the picture below from 2014 showing her with former WWE star Sheldon Benjamin demonstrates. 
she dated she dated X Pac. Now I wonder if X Pac hit it before or after China. I'm guessing before China, but I'm, I'm glad to see X Pac said he probably said to himself, "Hey, I want a piece of that ass before she's out of here." Since Jamie Noble was hitting it, man, I tell you, hey X Pac, do you have a sex tape of uh, of you and Nidia somewhere lying around? Let, let us know. Of all the tough enough winners, none had more potential than John Morrison, also a member of the, of the famous tag team Eminem with Joy Mercury and Melina. He actually failed in his Tough Enough 2 audition after Kevin Dunn made it clear that he didn't like him at all, but made it through to Tough Enough 3, which he won along with Matt Capitelli. Capitel Following the expected Ohio Valley Wrestling Stay, Morrison debuted on the March 1st, 2004 Raw as Johnny Blaze. The next week, he was renamed Johnny Spade. Three weeks after that, he was given the moniker Johnny Nitro. Considering the frequent name changes, it was clear that WWE had no idea what to do with him and sent it back to OVW. WWD has no fucking idea what to do with somebody. Boy, we, boy, we see a lot of that now. They don't know what to fu they don't know what the fuck to do with uh, Cesaro. They don't know what the fuck to do with, with uh, Dolph Ziggler. WWE just just doesn't know what the fuck to do. Period. But they fired their top executive, who oversees. The creative team, all WWE network programming, and so forth and so on. While in OVW, he formed a very entertaining tag team with Joey Mercury. They had a decent run on SmackDown, but Nitro was clearly meant to be a single star. Unfortunately, his and girlfriend Melina backstage attitudes ensured that it didn't happen, at least for a while. Nitro was rechristened John Morrison and had a, a very good run in WWE as a mid to upper card mid talent before opting to leave the company in 2011. The, shame, the shaman of sexy has been busy since leaving McMahon land, working in film and television and wrestling regularly on, uh, on the independent circuit. Under his newest name, Johnny Mundo, Morrison is one of the stars of the Big L. Ray Network's groundbreaking series, Lucha Underground, which for those who have the L. Ray Network on cable, I do not, unfortunately. I recommend watching Lucha Underground. I recommend watching Ring of Honor. I recommend watching... TNA Impact Wrestling, and I damn sure recommend watching Global Force Wrestling when it gets a TV deal. Anyway, folks, in closing, as you can see, Tough Enough is bullshit and needs to be canceled for good. If you want to become a wrestler, do it the way the old school guys did it, and train hard with the right people and get into wrestling, and if you want to go to WWE, that's fine. Uh, the money's probably good, but just be careful. Just, uh, just know their corporate structure. WWE is not a wrestling company. WWE is a corporate, bigamist, racist circus. Lucha Underground, that's a wrestling company. TNA Impact, that's a wrestling company. Ring of Honor, that's a wrestling, com a wrestling company. Shimmer is a wrestling, co wrestling company. Shine is a wrestling company. Lucha Libre, all the Lucha Libre promotions are wrestling, com are wrestling companies. WWE is not. And WWE Tough Enough needs to be canceled ASAP. I mean, how many lives have to be ruined? You know, not all of them have been ruined, but some have bounced back into, into good careers outside wrestling. That's good. But the ones that have been ruined or damaged, you know, somehow this needs to be a, a prevented in the future. So, it, you know, I don't know. Uh, let me know your thoughts and uh, leave your comments. Peace.